This chapter is from Chapter 37 in MedSurge Timby, Caring for Clients with Central and Peripheral Nervous System Disorders. Learning Objectives Name the three components within the cranium and explain the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. Discuss at least four signs and symptoms and nursing care of the client with increased intracranial pressure. Name four infectious or inflammatory diseases that affect the central or peripheral nervous system. Discuss three neuromuscular disorders, common related problems, and nursing management. Discuss the nursing management of clients with a cranial nerve disorder. List the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Discuss the purpose of drug therapy and drugs commonly prescribed for Parkinson's disease. Describe signs and symptoms of Huntington's disease and related nursing management. Discuss the pathophysiology of seizure disorders and different types of seizures. Discuss the nursing management of clients with seizure disorders. Discuss the nursing management of clients with brain tumors. Acute disorders of the central nervous system, CNS, and peripheral nervous system, PNS, are potentially life-threatening. Chronic neurologic disorders, although not imminently fatal, profoundly affect a person's quality of life. This chapter discusses disorders in which components of the CNS or PNS are damaged, removed, or destroyed, which can result in neurologic de deficits. Increased intracranial pressure. Inside the cranium, there are one, brain tissue, two, blood, and three, cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. The brain represents 80% of the cranial contents. The blood within the cranium contributes 10% of the total, and the CSF provides the remaining 10%. According to the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis, if one or more of these increases significantly without a decrease in either or both of the other two, intracranial pressure becomes elevated. Examples of disorders that may lead to increased ICP include brain tumors, traumatic brain injuries from concussions, ruptured cerebral aneurysms, stroke, obstructions in the circulation of CSF, and infectious disorders of the nervous system such as meningitis and encephalitis. Under normal circumstances, autoregulatory mechanisms keep brain tissue perfused with adequate oxygen and glucose. Dilation or constriction of cerebral blood vessels in response to changes in blood pressure, blood oxygen levels, and blood pH maintains constant and consistent tissue perfusion. For example, increased PaCO2, which is the carbon dioxide level in the blood, decreased blood pH, or decreased PaO2, which is the oxygen level in the blood, causes cerebral blood vessels to dilate. Nevertheless, a delicate range of ICP helps maintain autoregulation. Ideally, the ICP remains at 5 to 15 millimeters mercury to ensure normal cerebral perfusion pressure of 70 to 100 millimeters mercury. Many conditions, including brain tumors, swelling or bleeding within the brain from head trauma, infectious and inflammatory disorders of the brain, such as meningitis and encephalitis, cause increased ICP. When the intracranial volume and therefore the ICP begins to increase, some initial compensation occurs. CSF production may decrease or it may displace at a greater rate into venous circulation. However, as ICP continues to rise, vascular autoregulatory mechanisms can become compromised and fail. Hypotension and hypoxia lead to vasodilation, which contributes to increased ICP, compressing blood vessels, leading to cerebral ischemia. If increased ICP continues to be unrecognized or untreated, the contents of the cranium are compressed further. Unrelieved pressure causes brain tissue to herniate or shift from normal locations intracranially and extracranially. See figure 37.2. The foramen magnum, the opening of the lower part of the skull through which the upper part of the spinal cord connects with the brain, provides the only extracranial exit for brain tissue. If the brainstem herniates through the foramen magnum, respiration, heart rate, BP, and the functions of descending and ascending nerve fibers are affected. As increased ICP progresses, the consequences include impaired cellular activity, temporary or permanent neurologic dysfunction, or death. Increased intracranial pressure. Assessment findings. 
The signs and symptoms of increased ICP, Bux 37-1, can develop rapidly or slowly. When an increased ICP develops slowly, subtle changes can be overlooked. Decreasing level of consciousness, LOC, is one of the earliest signs of increased ICP. Clients may slip from alert and oriented to lethargic, stuporous, semi-comatose, and finally comatose. Confusion, restlessness, and periodic disorientation often accompany decreased LOC. An increased intracranial pressure. An assessment finding of lethargy in a client who has suffered multiple fractures like the kind resulting from a motorcycle accident is a significant indication that the client has early stages of ICP. Headache is another symptom of increased ICP. More severe in the morning, headache increases with activities that elevate ICP, such as coughing, sneezing, or straining at stool. Rest or elevation of the head relieves pain. A constant headache is a very bad sign. Vomiting, when associated with a neurologic condition, also suggests increasing ICP. Emesis commonly occurs without any forewarning of nausea. Papilledema is swelling of the optic nerve is caused by interference with venous drainage from the eye and is observed through examination with an ophthalmoscope. Pressure in the oculomotor nerve usually accompanies increased ICP and affects pupillary response to light. Normal pupillary response to strong light is rapid constriction. In increased ICP, the pupillary response is unequal. One pupil responds more sluggishly than the other or becomes fixed and dilated. Changes in ICP are heralded by a body temperature that may rise or fall depending on the etiology of the increased ICP or its effect on the temperature regulating center. This is accompanied by a series of changes in vital signs called Cushing's triad. Cushing's triad is characterized by one, a pulse rate that increases initially but then decreases, two, a systolic blood pressure that rises with a widening pulse pressure, which is the difference between the systolic and diastolic measurements, and three, a respiratory rate that is irregular. Cushing's triad occurs late in increased ICP. Later, Shane Stokes respirations occur, consisting of shallow, rapid breathing, followed by periods of apnea. Decorticate or decerebrate posturing, see page or chapter 36, develops spontaneously or in response to a painful stimulus when ICP is increased. Box 37.1 on page 618, Signs of increased intracranial pressure, early signs, drowsiness, difficult to awaken, restlessness, confusion, irritability, Glasgow coma scale greater than or equal to 13, personality changes, sluggish or unequal pupil response, weakness in arms or legs, slow or slurred speech, dull headache, especially upon awakening, vomiting without nausea. Late signs are unresponsiveness, Glasgow coma scale less than or equal to 12, Decreased response to painful stimuli, decorticate or decerebrate posturing, increased weakness or hemiparesis, dilated pupil or pupils, and seizures. Cushing's triad, bradycardia, elevated systolic blood pressure with wide pulse pressure and irregular breathing, loss of gag and corneal reflexes, and periods of apnea. And figures 37.3, page 618, the brain compensates for increases in intracranial pressure by autoregulation in the following ways, limiting blood flow to the head, increasing absorption or decreasing production of CSF, withdrawing fluid from brain tissue and excreting it through the kidneys. When compensatory mechanisms become ineffective in reducing intracranial pressure, brain damage or death can result. Initially, brain insult caused by trauma, con contusion, laceration, intracranial hemorrhage, Cerebral edema following surgery, stroke, infection, hypoxia, hydrocephalus, space occupying lesions such as a tumor or abscess, causes slight increase in ICP. There's an attempt at normal regulation of ICP by decreased blood flow to the head, which causes a slight decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure, CPP, which causes a loss of autoregulatory mechanism of constriction or dilation of cerebral blood vessels if increased ICP persists, which causes passive dilation, which increases cerebral blood flow and venous congestion, which further increases ICP, which causes cellular hypoxia, which causes one or two or both things, uncle or central herniation, 
or and further decrease in CPP, ultimately both leading to brain death. Diagnostic findings. Diagnostic tests that determine the underlying cause of increased ICP include skull radiography, computed tomography, CT, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, lumbar punctures, and cerebral angiography. Medical and surgical management. Immediate treatment aims at decreasing ICP by relieving the cause if possible. The goals are to maintain blood pressure, prevent hypoxia, and ensure cerebral perfusion. To maintain cerebral tissue perfusion and blood pressure, the physician administers isotonic normal saline, lactated ringers, or hypertonic 3% saline solutions. Hypotonic solutions and solutions containing glucose are avoided because they increase ICP. Providing supplemental oxygen to keep the arterial oxygen saturation, SAO2, at 95% prevents hypoxia. Because increased PaCO2 results in cerebral vasodilation, hyperventilation using a mechanical ventilator was used in the past to promote cerebral vasoconstriction and decrease the volume and pressure in the cranium. However, aggressive or prolonged hyperventilation can result in complications because it can exacerbate brain injury from cerebral vasoconstriction and cellular necrosis. The imminent possibility of brain her herniation or an acute sharp increase in ICP is the only justification for hyperventilation. Mild hyperventilation to maintain the PaCO2 between 30 and 35 millimeters mercury can be used, but only when other measures are ineffective. The client's head is maintained in midline at 30 degrees of elevation to promote venous drainage of blood and CSF. Persistent hyperthermia caused by altered functioning of the hypothalamus may require measures such as administering acetaminophen, Tylenol, or applying a cooling blanket to maintain normothermia. Care must be taken to avoid hypothermia because shivering can increase ICP. The physician can control this client's seizures which elevate ICP by administering diazepam, Valium, and phosphenitoin, which is Cerebrix. Phosphenitoin, a parenterally administered anticonvulsant, is a pro-drug, a drug that pharmacokinetically converts to another active compound. Phosphenitoin becomes phenytoin, or dilantin, when it is metabolized. It is indicated for short-term parenteral use when oral phenytoin is unavailable or less advantageous. The physician may prescribe a benzodiazepine such as midazolam, which is Versed, to sedate an agitated client because hyperactivity contributes to transient rises in ICP. Healthcare professionals currently question the use of barbiturate coma therapy because it lowers metabolic brain requirements and the resultant sedation contributes to hypotension, pneumonia, hypoxia, and respiratory depression. With sudden ICP, check to see if the client has been taking an anticoagulant, especially when head trauma is involved. A hematoma could be forming from anticoagulant therapy, causing cranial bleeding. In review, maintain head and midline at 30 degrees of elevation, avoid hypothermia, control seizures with Valium, sedate agitated clients with Versed, Hyperactivity contributes to transient rises in ICP. Indwelling catheters, nasal gastric tubes, stool softeners, and histamine antagonists such as pepsid may be also used. Question. Which of the following nursing interventions will help prevent further increase in ICP? Encourage fluids, elevate the head of the bed, provide physical therapy, or reposition the client frequently? The answer is elevate the head of the bed. Elevation of the head of the bed reduces increased cranial pressure. All other options will cause an increase in ICP. To continue medical and surgical management, monitoring devices are inserted to measure ICP and in some cases to withdraw CSF. These devices are connected to a transducer and a monitor that displays the pressure and a waveform to detect the status of ICP. Moderate elevations 
and values range from 15 to 40 millimeters mercury and high levels exceed 40 millimeters mercury. Although the ICP varies, a rise of 2 millimeters mercury from a previous measurement is cause for concern. Normal ICP below 20 millimeters mercury is desirable. When the usual measures to reduce ICP are ineffective, osmotic diuretics such as mannitol, also called osmotrol, and fluid restriction are used. Care must be taken to avoid precipitating secondary brain injury from hypotension due to hypovolemia. Although corticosteroids such as dexamethasone or decadron have reduced ICP in the past, their use is now restrained. Current thinking is that steroids are not effective in reducing increased ICP with traumatic brain injury. Among other side effects, steroids may cause upper GI bleeding, which can create another complication for a client who is acutely ill. Depending on the degree and cause of increased ICP, the physician may order the insertion of an indwelling catheter, a nasogastric tube for gastric decompression, or provision of tube feedings, a stool softener to prevent straining at stool, and a histamine antagonist such as famatidine or pepsid to prevent stress ulcers. Emergency surgery is done to remove a blood clot if increased ICP results from a head injury with bleeding above or below the dura. See Chapter 39. Surgery is also performed to relieve pressure caused by a brain tumor. Nursing management of the client with increased ICP is presented in Nursing Care Plan 37-1, page 620 and 621. Infectious and Inflammatory Disorders of the Nervous System Four neurologic conditions have an infectious or inflammatory cause. Meningitis, encephalitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and brain abscess. Meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges caused by various infectious microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. The inflammation often extends to the cerebral cortex. Depending on the causative organism, the client's condition may be mild and or may rapidly become critical. Most adults with bacterial meningitis, the most serious form of meningitis, recover without permanent neurologic damage or dysfunction. When complications do occur, they are usually serious. Pathophysiology and etiology. The most highly contagious and potentially lethal form of meningitis is caused by either of two bacteria, meningococci, Neisseria meningi meningitis, and streptococci, which is streptococcus pneumonia. Meningococcal meningitis usually affects school-aged children, young adults, and immunosuppressed people. Viruses such as herpes simplex virus, mumps virus, and enteroviruses, which are common intestinal viruses, can cause viral meningitis, a milder form of the disease. Viral meningitis is more common in children and in older adults. The infecting microorganisms circulate from blood and lymph to cerebral capillaries or by direct extension from infected areas such as the middle ear and the paranasal sinuses. When the pathogens arrive in the cerebral circulation, they travel to the subarachnoid space of the meninges where the inflammatory process begins. In virulent cases, cerebral edema and inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone, which increases fluid volume, causes increased ICP. Cerebral vasculitis, inflammation of blood vessels in the brain, may be present and cerebral blood flow may be decreased. The client may develop seizures, a brain abscess, neurologic changes, irreversible coma, and death from brain herniation. Neurologic sequelae in survivors include damage to the cranial nerves that facilitate vision and hearing. Assessment findings. Classic signs and symptoms include headache, fever, and nuchal, N-U-C-H-A-L, rigidity, which means pain and stiffness of the neck, inability to place the chin on the chest, nausea, vomit, vomiting, photophobia, aversion or sensitivity to light, restlessness, irritability, and seizures may also develop. Severe irritation of the meninges causes opistho Tonus, O-P-I-S-T-H-O-T-O-N-O-S, an extreme hyperextension of the head and arching of the back. A positive Koenig's sign, inability to extend the leg when the thigh is flexed on the abdomen, 
and a positive Brudzinski sign, which is flexion of the neck, produces flexion of the knees and hips, are seen. See figure 37.6 on page 624. Gerontologic considerations. Older adults may not exhibit the typical signs and symptoms of meningitis. Rather, they may display a change in mental status, slight to no fever, and no nuchal rigidity or headache. Mortality rates are high in older adults with this disease, partly because of these atypical signs and symptoms. Contributing factors to death from meningitis are chronic illness and delays in diagnosis. The client with meningococcal meningitis may have multiple small to large petechiae that spread over the body given the appearance of a rug burn. There's small red dots. We want to look them up. The petechiae intensify and coalesce. They fuse together to resemble purpura or ecchymosis due to a secondary disturbance in blood coagulation from thrombocytopenia or disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Those with viral meningitis develop a nonspecific maculopapular rash. Diagnostic findings. A lumbar puncture is performed and samples of CSF are obtained. If the meningitis is bacterial, the CSF appears cloudy. The CSF pressure is elevated, glucose concentration is decreased, protein levels are elevated, and white blood cell count and red blood cell counts are increased. Culture and sensitivity studies are performed to identify the specific causative bacteria. If meningitis is viral, the results of culture and sensitivity studies are negative. A CT scan, blood culture, complete blood cell count, CBC, and other laboratory tests are used to rule out other possible disorders. Medical management. Measures to manage and reduce ICP are used in the acute stage of infection. Taking precaution against diseases and hand hygiene are important in controlling the spread of infection. The local public health department is notified of all cases. IV fluids and antimicrobial therapy are started immediately when bacterial meningitis is suspected. The appropriate antibiotic, usually penicillin, acephalosporin, acephalosporin, rifampin, rifadin, vancomycin, or chloramphenicol, which is chloramycetin, is determined when the causative microorganism is identified from the results of a sensitivity test. Drug therapy is continued after the acute phase of the illness to prevent recurrence. Anticonvulsants are necessary if seizures occur. Household members, contacts at daycare centers, roommates in a college dorm, those living in the same military barracks, and anyone else directly exposed to an infected person's oral secretions are placed on one or two doses of prophylactic preventative oral rifampin, called rifadin, ciprofloxin, which is known as cipro, azithromycin, which is known as zithromax, or a single dose of intramuscular cephriaxone, which is rocephin. Many colleges and universities now recommend immunization for meningococcal meningitis, meningococcal polysaccharide vaccine, immunization for haemophilus influenza B, HIV, Hib, which is part of the series of childhood immunizations, can also reduce the acquisition of bacterial meningitis caused by that pathogen. Encephalitis is an inflammatory process affecting the CNS. It is characterized by swelling of the brain and pathologic changes in both the white and gray matter and surrounding meninges. Pathophysiology and etiology. Various causes of encephalitis exist, but the most common include vector-borne viral infections, complications from viral infections such as rubiola, which is measles, or neurotoxic effects associated with childhood vaccination. Viruses that cause encephalitis include the St. Louis, Western Equine, Eastern Equine, and West Nile viruses. Ticks or mosquitoes can transmit some of these viruses. Infected birds bitten by the common Culex, C-U-L-E-X, mosquito can transmit West Nile and St. Louis viruses. The virus remains in the mosquito's salivary glands and the mosquito can inject the virus into humans and animals during blood feeding. In data for the years 1999 through 2015, there were a total of 43,937 cases and 1,911 deaths from West Nile virus in the United States. Some of those bitten and infected by a mosquito carrying West Nile virus experienced no symptoms or mild flu-like symptoms. 
whereas others become severely ill and die from subsequent encephalitis. Poisoning by drugs and chemicals such as lead, arsenic, and carbon monoxide may closely resemble encephalitis clinically. When encephalitis occurs, there is severe diffuse inflammation in the brain. Nerve cell destruction can be extensive, cerebral edema, neurologic deficits such as paralysis and speech changes, increased ICP, respiratory failure, seizure disorders, and shock can occur. Assessment findings. At the onset of viral encephalitis, symptoms include sudden fever, severe headache, stiff neck, vomiting, and drowsiness. During physical assessment, there may be evidence of insect bites. The client may disclose information about immunization or an activity such as a recent camping trip that suggests possible exposure to mosquitoes, other vectors, or a neurotoxic substance. As the infection worsens, the client may develop tremors, seizures, spastic or flaccid paralysis, irritability, and muscle weakness. Lethargy, delirium, or coma develops. Incontinence and visual disturbances such as photophobia, involuntary eye movements, and double or blurred vision occur. A lumbar puncture is performed. CSF pressure is elevated, but the fluid is clear. In some types of encephalitis, such as West Nile virus infection, blood or CSF shows a rise in immunoglobulin M, IgM, antibodies. Electroencephalography, EEG, reveals slow waveforms. The physician may order other diagnostic tests, such as MRI or CT scan, to rule out other etiologies of the symptoms. Medical management. Because no specific antiviral measure has been developed, treatment of viral encephalitis is supportive. The client's symptoms are managed with antipyretics, anticonvulsants, anti-inflammatory drugs, and analgesics. Nursing management. The nurse monitors vital signs and level of consciousness frequently and compares findings with previous assessments. If urinary retention or urinary incontinence develops, the nurse consults the physician to discuss whether an indwelling urethral catheter is appropriate. The nurse measures fluid intake and output to detect signs of fluid volume deficit and electrolyte imbalances and assesses bowel elimination to determine if the client needs an enema or a stool softener. For additional nursing management, refer to the concept care map. Client and family teaching 37.1 lists measures for reducing potential bites from mosquitoes, such as the Culex species of mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus and St. Louis encephalitis, anopheles mosquitoes that cause malaria, and the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes that transmit the Zika virus. Client and family teaching 37.1 measures to control exposure to mosquitoes. Pay attention to surveillance reports concerning the incidence of birds infected with West Nile virus or St. Louis virus in your community. Avoid being outdoors during peak mosquito biting time such as early evening. Wear clothing that covers as much skin as possible when outdoors. Apply insect repellent containing permethrin or DEET, D-E-E-T, to clothing and exposed skin. Repair or replace windows and door screens. Place netting around strollers and infant carriers. Empty outdoor items frequently that may hold standing water, such as pet dishes, bird baths, flower pots, and pool covers. Transport discarded tires to a location for waste management. Clear gutters of debris that may obstruct the drainage of rainwater. Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre syndrome, <clears throat> acute post-infectious polyneuropathy, poly radiculoneuritis affects the peripheral nerves and the spinal nerve roots. Most clients begin to show signs of recovery about one month after the progression of symptoms stop. Recovery may be slow and take one year or more. Death can occur from complications of immobility, such as pneumonia and infection. Pathophysiology and etiology. Although the exact cause of the disorder is unknown, Guillain-Barre syndrome is believed to be an autoimmune reaction, see chapter 34, that follows a primary disorder, especially one that is infectious. Many clients have a history of recent viral infection, particularly of the respiratory tract. Others have a history of recent surgery or recent vaccination for a viral disease, such as influenza. The syndrome also occurs in clients with malignant diseases and lupus. 
Antibodies attack the Schwann cells, S-C-H-W-A-N-N, that make up the insulating myelin sheath surrounding the axons on nerves. The affected nerves become inflamed and edematous. As myelin becomes disrupted, nerve transmission becomes abnormal. Mild to severe ascending muscle weakness, tingling and numbness, or paralysis develops from the legs upward. Overactivity or underactivity of the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system is evidenced by changes in blood pressure as well as in heart rate and rhythm. Eventually, the myelin regenerates, function is restored, and recovery begins in reverse sequence from the upper body downward. Assessment findings. <clears throat> Although symptoms vary, weakness, numbness, and tingling in the arms and legs that the client may perceive as painful are often the first symptoms. The weakness is progressive and moves to upper areas of the body and affects the muscles of respiration. Paralysis may follow muscle weakness. If cranial nerve involvement develops, chewing, talking, and swallowing become difficult. A lumbar puncture reveals elevated CSF protein levels and pressure. The results of electrophysiologic testing show, un, show marked slowing in the conduction of nerve impulses. Additional neurologic tests are performed to rule out other possible CNS disorders with similar symptoms. Medical management. Plasmapheresis, removal of plasma from the blood and reinfusion of the cellular components with saline has been shown to shorten the course of the disease if performed within the first two weeks. Administration of IV immunoglobulin, known as gamun N, soon after symptoms manifest may enhance improvement. Otherwise, treatment is primarily supportive. For example, the physician may order gabapentin, also known as Neurontin, or a tricyclic antidepressant such as amyltryptyline, which is known as Elevil, or an opioid to relieve discomfort. If the respiratory muscles are involved, endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation becomes necessary. Difficulty chewing and swallowing necessitates the administration of IV fluids, gastric tube feedings, or total parenteral nutrition, TPN. In review, diagnostic findings include Lumbar punctures, electrophysiologic testing, medical management includes plasmapheresis and giving immune globulin, gamun N. Nursing management is assessed signs of respiratory distress, barometer, skin care, change position every two hours, range of motion exercises to prevent muscle atrophy. Again, review of nursing management. The nurse observes the client closely for signs of respiratory distress using a spirometer to evaluate the client's ventilation capacity. To assess for pneumonia, the nurse checks vital signs and lung sounds frequently. Because immobility incapacitates the client, the nurse provides meticulous skin care and changes the client's position every two hours. The nurse also helps the client perform active and passive exercises to prevent muscle atrophy. For further aspects of client care, see Nutrition Notes 37.1. Six twenty-eight. You have a picture thirty-seven eight. Peripheral nerve demyelination associated with Guillain-Barré syndrome is shown, showing the motor neuron and a normal myelin sheath, and then a degeneration of a myelin sheath with swelling and inflammation. Also, you can see on page six twenty-nine the process of demyelination. A and B picture depict a normal nerve cell and axon with myelin, and C and D in the picture show the slow disintegration of myelin, which disrupts axon function. Nutrition notes 37.1. The client with a neurologic infectious inflammatory disorder. Infectious disorders often cause anorexia, altered nutrition, nutrient metabolism, increased caloric needs, and a negative nitrogen balance, which may further compromise immune system functioning. To promote an adequate intake, small frequent meals of nutrient and calorie dense foods are encouraged. High protein liquid supplements can develop a high nutrient load with a minimum amount of effort. Brain abscess. A brain abscess is a collection of purulent material in the brain. If untreated, it can be fatal. 
A brain abscess occurs from an infection in nearby structures, such as the middle ear, sinuses, or teeth, or from an infection in other organs. A brain abscess can develop after intracranial surgery or head trauma. It can be secondary to such disorders as bacterial endocarditis, bacteremia, and pulmonary or abdominal infections. A brain abscess produces neurologic changes according to its location. Because it occupies space in the cranium, increased ICP can develop. Complications include paralysis, mental deterioration, a seizure disorder, and visual disturbances. Assessment findings. Manifestations of a brain abscess include signs of increased ICP, fever, headache, and neurologic changes such as paralysis, seizures, muscle weakness, and lethargy. Lab tests show an elevated WBC count. Analysis of CSF is obtained by lumbar puncture, helps to confirm the diagnosis, but this procedure has a risk of herniation of the brainstem. A CT scan, MRI, and skull radiographs are safer techniques for diagnosing and locating the abscess. Medical and surgical management. Antimicrobial therapy begins once the diagnosis is confirmed. A craniotomy, discussed later in this chapter, is typically performed to drain the abscess. Cerebral edema and seizures are treated with drug therapy. Additional treatment includes control of fever, mechanical ventilation, IV fluids, and nutritional support. Nursing management. Nursing management, the nurse assesses frequently for altered level of consciousness, changes in sensory and motor functions, and signs of increased ICP, and monitors vital signs frequently. The nurse measures fluid intake and output because overhydration can lead to cerebral edema. See Nursing Care Plan 37-1 for the client with increased ICP for more detailed discussion. Neuromuscular disorders. A neuromuscular disorder involves the nervous system and indirectly affects the muscles. Some examples include multiple sclerosis, abbreviated MS, myasthenia gravis, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is abbreviated ALS, all of which are chronic and progressively debilitating. Multiple sclerosis is a chronic progressive disease of the peripheral nerves. Its onset is in young adulthood and early middle age. The incidence is greatest between 20 and 40 years of age, and it affects men and women approximately equally. MS is more common in northern temperate zones than in warm climates. Pathophysiology and etiology. MS is considered an autoimmune disorder that researchers believe is triggered by a defective gene or defective genes. Studies show that it is associated with an inflammation that affects genes involved in controlling the immune system. Other research has shown a link between a distorted gene that causes vitamin D deficiency and MS. MS is characterized by a demyelinating disease because it causes permanent degeneration and destruction of myelin. Myelin acts as an insulator, enabling nerve impulses to pass along a nerve fiber. Loss of myelin and subsequent degeneration and atrophy of nerve axons interrupt transmission of impulses along these fibers. Many clients experience gradual and continuous worsening of their symptoms. A few have the disease in a mild form and do not experience increased severity of symptoms. For some, the symptoms subside during early phases of the illness, called remission, and the client seems healthy for several months or even years. However, with each reappearance exacerbation, the symptoms become more severe and last longer. Infections and emotional upsets precipitate exacerbations. Some people live a long time with MS and survival for 20 years after the diagnosis is not unusual. As the disease progresses, many complications such as pressure ulcers, cachexia, deformities, and contractures develop. Pneumonia brought about by limited activity, shallow breathing, and general debility is often the immediate cause of death. Assessment findings, signs and symptoms. Many clients first dismiss minor symptoms as a result of fatigue or strain. When they no longer can ignore symptoms, clients with MS report blurred vision, diplopia, which is double vision, diplopia, nystagmus, which is involuntary movement of the eyeball, weakness, clumsiness, and numbness and tingling of an arm or a leg. 
an intention tremor and slurred hesitant speech, which is called scanning speech, may develop. Mood swings, emotional lability are common. Weakness of an arm or a leg progresses to ataxia, which is motor incoordination, or paraplegia, which is paralysis of both legs. Occasional bowel and bladder incontinence lead to total incontinence. Slight visual disturbances and in blindness. The illness impairs intellectual functioning late in its course. Loss of memory, difficulty concentrating, and impaired judgment occur. Diagnostic findings. Early diagnosis is difficult because symptoms are vague and in some cases temporary. A lumbar puncture and CSF analysis reveal an increased WBC count. Electrophoresis of the CSF, a technique for electrically separating and identifying proteins, demonstrate abnormal aminoglobulin G bands described as oligoclonal bands. The bands appear separated rather than homogeneous, which is the normal finding. A CT scan and MRI may or may not disclose lesions in the brain's white matter. Medical management. There is no cure for MS, nor is there any single treatment that relieves all symptoms. The primary aim of treatment is to keep the client functional as long as possible. Current research for promoting nerve regeneration exists in four areas. One, stimulating nearby oligodendrocytes, which are cells with projections that continue as myelin sheaths to move to the diseased neurons and replace the damaged myelin. Two, identifying and reversing the inhibitors of remyelination. Three, producing growth factors that stimulate neural myelin repair. And four, recruiting replacement cells such as cord blood and fetal stem cells to become myelin producing cells. The first disease modifying drugs used to treat MS were interferons, such as interferon B la, called Avanox, Avanex. Interferon B one B is beta serone and fingolomide, which is known as galenia. However, additional new drugs classified as immunosuppressives rather than immunomodulators, such as Lemtrada and Tisabri, and an oral drug, Abagio. These are all listed on page 630 in MedSurge book. Another approach used in the management of MS is drug therapy with Copaxone. This non-interferon, non-steroidal medication reduces the frequency of exacerbations of MS. Glatiramir acetate changes harmful inflammatory T cells that destroy myelin into protective T cells that suppress myelin depletion. All drugs for MS have been shown to re reduce relapse rates by 28% to 68%. This is as of 2016. Other drugs that may be used to treat symptoms that accompany MS include baclofen and dantrolene, which is dantrium, for muscle spasticity and rigidity, antibiotics for infection, and tranquilizers to alleviate, alleviate mood swings. Oxybutynin, which is ditropan, and botulinum toxin, which is Botox, are used to manage urinary incontinence, and urocholine is used to relieve urinary retention. The anti-inflammatory action of corticosteroids relieves symptoms and hastens remissions. There are serious issues with the following newer MS agents. AUBAGIO, Abagio, or teraflunamide, can cause birth defects. Women should be tested for pregnancy before starting this drug and use effective birth control while taking the drug. Men whose partners plan to become pregnant should not use this drug either. Fingolimid, which is known as Gelenva, G-I-L-E-N-V-A, may cause progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a rare but serious brain infection. Nursing management. The nurse assesses the client's physical and emotional status to determine any new developments or changes in previously assessed conditions. Identify whether the client has visual problems and emphasize that these may diminish when a remission occurs. Listen to the client's speech, which may be slurred and difficult to understand. Recommend using a language board or other assistive device if communication is severely affected. Adaptive devices for self-care and feeding may be helpful if the client has hand tremors.
The client's weight should be assessed regularly to ensure that there is no significant weight loss. Eventually, the client's food may require blenderization if swallowing is impaired. See nutrition notes. If ambulation is impaired, the client may find a wheelchair or other device to be used temporarily. Safety is a real issue for clients as their mobility becomes less stable. The nurse may identify techniques for managing constipation with high fiber foods and fluids. Bladder elimination may be controlled with intermittent catheterization, inserting an indwelling catheter or creation of a cystostomy. Skin care and position changes are implemented to avoid pressure sores. The nurse provides instruction concerning drug therapy, which often facilitates a remission of unknown duration or reduction in the rate of relapse. The nurse or family may be referred to a social worker to determine if the client qualifies for social security and disability benefits. For additional nursing management, refer to the nursing process for the client with a chronic neuromuscular disorder, which appears later in the chapter, which is chapter 37. All the disease-modifying drugs just decrease immune cells and infection protection. Therefore, be aware of increased risk for acquired infections, especially if the client is catheterized. Myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular disorder characterized by severe weakness of one or more groups of skeletal muscles. Myasthenia gravis is more common in women, but it can affect both genders. The onset of the illness generally occurs during the young adult years. Pathophysiology and etiology. Although its exact cause is unknown, the disease is believed to be autoimmune in nature. It develops when antibodies, perhaps produced by the thymus gland, bind to and degrade acetylcholine receptors on the surface of skeletal muscles. The outcome is extreme muscle weakness during activity. Strength is restored with rest. See figure 3710, page 631. Inhibition of synaptic transmission of acetylcholine in myasthenia gravis leads to profound muscle weakness. Assessment findings. Muscle weakness varies depending on the muscles affected. The most common manifestations are ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelids. Difficulty chewing and swallowing, diplopia, diplopia voice weakness, mask-like facial expression, and weakness of the extremities. The respiratory system is also affected. During a myasthenic crisis, the client experiences increased muscle weakness, respiratory distress, decreased tidal volume, and difficulty talking, swallowing, and chewing. Diagnostic confirmation for myasthenia gravis is made by IV administration of tensilon, otherwise known as edrophenomium, E-D-R-O-P-H-O-N-I-U-M, otherwise known as tensilon, which relieves muscle weakness in a few seconds. The restored muscle strength then dissipates in about five minutes. Most manifest an elevated acetylcholine receptor antibody titer. Chest radiography may show an enlargement of the thymus, thymus called thymoma. Electromyography measures the electrical potential of muscles. Medical and surgical management. Treatment involves facilitating normal neurotransmission with administration of an acetylcholinesterase drug such as mestinon, M-E-S-T-I-N-O-N, prostigmin, and mitolase. Mestinon has a generic name, pyridostigmine bromide, Prostigmin has a generic name, neostigmine, and mitolase has a generic name, ambonium chloride. The therapeutic effect of these drugs prolong the action of acetylcholine, which sustains muscle contraction. The dose of the drug is adjusted according to the client's response to therapy. Other treatments include surgical removal of the thymus gland, prednisone, or another type of immunosuppressant, such as imurin and plasmapheresis three times a week for clients who do not respond to other methods of therapy. If myasthenic crisis with severe respiratory distress occurs, the client requires intubation and mechanical ventilation. Imurin, the drug I mentioned, that is an immunosuppressant. Generic name is 
azathioprine, azathioprine. Nursing management. The nurse provides periods of rest for the client to promote restoration of strength. In addition, the nurse supports ventilation by elevating the head of the bed and suctioning secretions that cause difficulty in swallowing for the client. The nurse also makes an effort to understand the client's efforts at communication during periods when the disease compromises intelligible speaking. The nurse demonstrates patience and empathy to help the client deal with changes in appearance, function, and lifestyle. The effects of drug therapy are observed, especially when first initiated or at times of stress. The nurse must administer medications at the exact intervals ordered to maintain therapeutic blood levels and prevent symptoms from returning. He or she observes for signs of drug overdose, such as abdominal cramps, clenched jaws, and muscle rigidity, which indicate that the dose is excessive. For more information, see nursing process for the client with a chronic neuromuscular disorder. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, known as ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a progression and fatal neurologic disorder. The disease is more common in men than women. The cause of ALS is unknown. The disease is characterized by degeneration of the motor neurons of the spinal cord and brainstem, which results in muscle weakness and assessment findings. Progressive muscle weakness and wasting of the arms, legs, and trunk develop. The client experiences episodes of muscle fasciculations, which is twitching. If ALS affects the brainstem, speaking and swallowing become difficult. The client may display periods of inappropriate laughter and crying. Respiratory failure and total paralysis are seen in the terminal stage. This disorder is difficult to diagnose in the early stages because no specific diagnosis, diagnostic tests are available for this disease. Electromyography, validates weakness in the affected muscles. Medical management. There is no specific treatment and death occurs several years after diagnosis in many cases. The client is encouraged to remain active as long as possible. Death usually results from respiratory arrest or overwhelming respiratory infection. Mechanical ventilation is necessary when ALS affects the muscles of respiration. Clients are usually treated with Rilutec, R-I-L-U-T-E-K, generic name Riluzole, Riluzole, which slows the progression of ALS and delays the need for a tracheostomy. However, current research is tracking the effect of Rocephin, Ceftriaxone, and Mirapex, Primapixole, the cancer drug Tamoxifen, and an unnamed drug called Isis, I-S-I-S, which appear to have neuroprotective properties when taken by people with ALS. In earlier clinical trials, ISIS 333611, which is injected within the subarachnoid space of the spinal canal, did not show serious adverse effects. However, the participants in the study were quite small. The drug continues in clinical trials. Nursing management. The nurse performs a comprehensive assessment and develops a plan of care on the basis of the client's identified problems. During the early stages of ALS, the nurse provides assistance with walking, bathing, shaving, and dressing. As ALS progresses, the client becomes totally dependent on the family or health care providers for care. The nurse teaches the family members required skills, such as suctioning techniques, how to administer tube feedings, and catheter care. Client and family teaching, 37.2 provides more information, as does nursing process for the client with a chronic neuromuscular disorder. Additional discussion on caring for clients with a neurological deficit is covered in Chapter 40. Review Chapter 10 for the care of clients in the terminal phase of disease. Client and family teaching, 37.2, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The nurse reviews the following components with the client and family. Medication schedule, adverse effects of medicines, dietary and feeding suggestions, agencies that can help or with or give home care, sources of financial assistance, exercises to prevent muscle atrophy, positioning and good skin care, and techniques for preventing skin breakdown. Cranial nerve disorders, trigeminal neuralgia, tic de la rue, 
Trigeminal neuralgia is a painful condition that involves the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, or CN5, which has three major branches, mand mandibular, maxillary, and ophthalmic. This sensory and motor nerve is important in chewing, facial movement, and sensation. The cause of the disorder is unknown. It has been suggested that it is related to compression of the trigeminal nerve root. For reasons not fully understood, the client experiences neuralgia, which is nerve pain, in one or more branches of the trigeminal nerve. The slightest stimulus, vibration of music, passing breeze, temperature change, over trigger points, areas that provoke the pain, can initiate an attack. The forehead over the eyebrow is a common trigger point when the ophthalmic branch of the nerve is affected. Assessment findings. The client describes the pain as sudden, severe, and burning. The pain ends as quickly as it begins, usually lasting a few seconds to several minutes. The cycle repeats many times each day. During a spasm, the face twitches and the eyes tear. Skull radiography, MRI, or CT are performed to rule out other pathologies, such as a brain tumor and intracranial bleeding. Ultimately, the diagnosis is based on the symptoms. Diagnostic findings. The skull, radiography, MRI, and CT scan are used. Surgical management. If medical management is unsatisfactory, surgical intervention is an option. Remember, medical management is primarily supportive and symptomatic rather than curative. Opioids are necessary. Anticonvulsants such as phenytoin, dilantin, and carbazim which is Tegretol, are used to reduce pain, but this approach is not always successful. The client is referred to a dentist because correction of dental malocclusion has relieved some cases of trigeminal neuralgia. Surgical management. If medical management is unsatisfactory, surgical intervention is an option. Surgical division of the sensory root of the trigeminal nerve provides permanent relief. However, some permanent loss of sensation accompanies this procedure. If the mandibular branch is severed, eating becomes a problem. The client may bite the tongue without realizing it. Food may be caught in the mouth and the jaw deviates toward the operative side. Until the client adjusts to the altered sensation, mm -hmm. swallowing is difficult. Nursing management. Assessment. Obtain a complete history and then carefully and gently examine the affected area. Ask the client to identify the location, pattern, and events associated with pain and document the information. Inspect the oral cavity for signs of injury. Weigh the client and assess the client's ability to eat food. Diagnosis, planning, and interventions. Acute pain related to stimulation over the trigeminal nerve as evidenced by client's description of localized discomfort. Expected outcome. Pain will be relieved or reduced to a tolerable level. Use a scale from 0 to 10 to help quantify the severity and intensity of pain, both before and after nursing intervention. Using a scaled range of numbers is the standard for assessing pain. Pain is assessed before and at least 30 minutes after a nursing intervention. Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy involves the seventh cranial nerve, CNV11, Roman numerals, that originates in the pons. At the location where the nerve exits the cranium, the nerve branches bilaterally into smaller fibers that supply the muscles for facial movement. The cause of Bell's palsy is unknown, but a viral link is suspected. Inflammation occurs around one of the paired facial nerves blocking motor impulses to muscles on one side of the face. Inflammation or ischemia leads to impaired neuromuscular function, which results in unilateral weakness and paralysis of facial Those whose paralysis is permanent failed to show improvement after three months or more. Assessment findings. Symptoms develop in a few hours or over one to two days. Facial pain, pain behind the ear, numbness, diminished blink reflex, ptosis of the eyelid, and tearing on the affected side occur. Speaking and chewing become difficult. There are no specific diagnostic tests for this disorder. Diagnosis is based on symptoms and visual examination of the face. Electromyography, EMG, is used to determine 
if there's any re residual nerve and muscle activity. In some instances, an MRI or CT scan is performed to rule out other etiologies, such as a brain tumor or stroke, which have comparable symptoms. Client and family teaching 37.3 trigeminal neuralgia. The nurse instructs the client as follows. Inspect the mouth daily for breaks in the mucous membrane. Take small sips or bites of food and concentrate on chewing and swallowing if surgery has been performed. Chew on the opposite side. Avoid eating hot foods. Use mouth, mouth rinses after eating. Keep regular dental appointments because the warning pain of a cavity, abscess, or other dental problem may be mistaken for neuralgia. Now, back to Bell's policy. Medical management, short-term, high-dose corticosteroid therapy with prednisone, deltazone, metacortin is prescribed to reduce nerve inflammation and edema. The steroid may be combined with an antiviral such as acyclovir, which is Zovirex, famciclovir, which is famvir, and valsaclovir, which is Valtrex, to inhibit viral replication and shorten the duration of symptoms. B-complex vitamins may also be beneficial. Various types of surgical reconstructive procedures referred to collectively as facial reanimation may be performed and to improve facial movement and appearance. Examples include repair of the facial nerve, connecting another nerve to the facial nerve, transferring muscles to allow movement of the face, and other cosmetic procedures such as a brow lift, face lift, and eyelid reconstruction. Extrapyridimal disorders. Extrapyridimal disorders have their origin in the motor co cortex and surrounding areas of the cerebellum and basal ganglia. Two examples of extrapyridimal disorders are Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. One of their primary characteristics is abnormal movement. Parkinson's disease usually begins after 50 years of age. It primarily affects the basal ganglia and connections in the substantia nigra and corpus striatum. See figure 3714. The term Parkinson is used to describe the cluster of Parkinson's-like symptoms that develop from several causes. Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism result from deficiency of the neurotransmitter dopamine. In the absence of dopamine, another area of the brain known as the globus pallatus, which responds to acetylcholine, becomes overactive. The imbalance between dopamine and acetylcholine results in a movement disorder that characterizes Parkinson's disease. In most cases of Parkinson's disease, no cause can be found for dopamine depletion. The symptoms of Parkinsonism has been associated with exposure to environmental toxins such as insecticides and herbicides and self-administration of an illegal synthetic form of heroin known as MPTP. Symptoms also can occur as a sequela of chronic traumatic encephalopathy from repeated blows to the head and encephalitis. Phenothiazines, a category of antipsychotic drugs and other dopamine receptor blocking antipsychotic drugs used to treat schizophrenia, also produce what is referred to as pseudo-Parkinsonism because the symptoms are reversible when the drug is discontinued. Manifestations of the disorder progress so slowly that years may elapse between the first symptom and diagnosis. The symptoms usually are unilateral, but eventually, whether quickly or slowly, become bilateral. Extrapyridimal disorders. Assessment findings, signs and symptoms. Early signs include stiffness, referred to as rigidity, and a pale rolling tremor, a circular movement of the fingers and wrist, as if manipulating a small object or pill within the palm, in one or both hands. The hand tremor is obvious at rest and typically decreases when movement is voluntary, such as picking up an object. Bradykinesia, slowness in performing spontaneous movements develops. Clients have a mask-like expression, stooped posture, hypophonia, which is low volume of speech, and difficulty swallowing saliva and food. Weight loss can occur. A shuffling gait is apparent and the client has difficulty turning or redirecting forward motion. Arms are rigid while walking. In late stages, the disease affects the jaw, tongue, and larynx, 
speech is slurred, and chewing and swallowing becomes difficult. Rigidity can lead to contractures. Salivation increases, accompanied by drooling. There is a high risk for aspiration. In a small percentage of clients, the eyes roll upward or downward and stay there involuntarily, agulogyric crisis, for several hours or even a few days. On page 637, figure 3714, they have a uh, series of chemical reactions that happen with Parkinson's. Nuclei in the substantia nigra protect fibers in the corpus striatum where the nerves carry dopamine. Loss of dopamine from nerve cells is thought to cause symptoms of Parkinson's. So destruction of dopaminergic neuronal, neuronal cells in the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia occur. This causes depletion of dopamine stores, which causes degeneration of the dopaminergic nigrostriatal pathway, which causes imbalance of excitatory acetylcholine and inhibiting dopamine neurotransmitters in the corpus striatum, which causes impairment of extrapyridomal tracts controlling complex body movements, which causes tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural changes. Diagnostic findings. Diagnosis is based on typical symptoms and a neurologic examination. There are no specific tests for this disorder. Medical management. The treatment aims at prolonging independence. Drugs such as selegaline, which is L-Dipril, which has neuroprotective properties. Dopaminergics, such as levodopa, called Laradopa or levodopa carbidopa, which is called cinnamate, amantadine, which is called simetrol, dopamine agonists, such as bromocryptine, which is parlodel, apomorphine, apokin, A-P-O-K-Y-N, is the newest approved drug, and the anticholinergics, such as benzotropine, which is cogentin, are prescribed. See the drug therapy table in 37.1 also to study that. Their sequence of use is based on the stage of the disorder and the decreasing effectiveness of the medication initially prescribed. Rehab measures such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, client and family education, and counseling are used concurrently with drug therapy. The client with Parkinson's disease. Nutritional notes. Unintentional weight loss is a common occurrence and may increase the risk for morbidity and mortality. Weight loss may be due to increased energy expenditure related to tremor, due to impaired intake related to diminished sense of smell, dysphagia, or depression, or from medication side effects such as dry mouth, nausea, anorexia, fatigue, or anxiety. Strategies to prevent or treat unintentional weight loss may include small, frequent meals, providing semi-solid foods to facilitate swallowing, and increasing the caloric density of foods served by added sauces and gravies, etc. Foods high in fiber, such as crushed bran added to hot cereal and fiber-fortified supplements help prevent constipation when consumed with adequate fluids. Prunes and prune juices stimulate peristalsis. Clients taking levodopa should avoid high intake of protein, meat, fish, poultry, and dairy because protein decreases its effectiveness. However, a high-protein diet may be needed for clients who experience unintentional weight loss. Surgical Management Stereotaxic pallidotomy is a surgical procedure performed in selected cases. This procedure destroys a part of the globus pallidus to eliminate or reduce tremor, stooped posture, shuffling gait, and stiff movement. Some clients with Parkinson's disease have obtained relief of symptoms through deep brain stimulation called DBS. DBS involves the implantation of a neurostimulator that works like a pacemaker for the brain. The neurostimulator sends electrical impulses from a battery implanted under the skin near the clavicle to the globus pallidus, thalamus, or subthalamic nucleus. The electrical stimulus blocks abnormal nerve signals that cause the Parkinsonian tremor. DBS eliminates the tremor in approximately 65% of people who have an implanted stimulator. Current research is, research is attempting to produce a similar effect by attaching electrodes to the surface of the brain rather than by implanting a stimulator within the brain. 
Many areas of research are being conducted to find additional methods for managing Parkinson's. Several clinical trials have shown that transplants of fetal dopamine neurons can survive transplantation, resulting in the improved clinical status of clients with Parkinson's disease. Dopamine secreting brain cells from pigs have been transplanted into people with Parkinson's disease with some success. However, there is some fear that viruses unique to pigs could jump species and infect humans, similar to the manner in which the HIV transfers from primates to humans. Consequently, this approach to treatment is not actively pursued. The most success has been reported using human fetal tissue transplantation in which brain tissue containing dopamine secreting cells is extracted from an aborted fetus and transplanted into the recipient's brain. Although the procedure continues to be performed for research and treatment purposes in other countries, it is considered unethical and currently not approved in the U.S. Under federal regulations identified by the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, a live fetus is protected from experimentation. The transplantation of retinal pigment epithelial cells, autotransplantation of cells from a person's own adrenal medulla into the brain, and cultivating stem cells from a person's own skin cells, which all require performing a craniotomy, show mixed results. Preliminary research indicates that these cells have produced and released dopamine and improved motor symptoms, but they are also accompanied by adverse effects. As a result, they are only in early experimental stages. Gene therapy is still highly experimental. Currently, there are efforts to manipulate a gene for glutamic acid decarboxylase. This enzyme is key in the production of the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, G-A-B-A, aminobutric acid. Research think, think that, researchers think that increasing GABA may inhibit the neurostimulating effects from the globus pallidus, similar to the effect achieved with the deep brain stimulator. Still another research approach for Parkinson's is to enhance glial cells derived neurotropic factor, GDNF. This substance stimulates growth of dopamine producing neurons. Finding a technique that improves the delivery of GDNF to the specific target areas in the brain has been the main obstacle of this project. Nursing management. Clients with Parkinsonism are admitted to the hospital because of the debilitating effects of the disease. Others are cared for in extended care facilities when they can no longer be managed at home in a chronic state. One of the biggest nurses challenges is managing the client's drug therapy. Levodopa is associated with periods of breakthrough or end of dose wearing off in which symptoms are exacerbated when a consistent drug level is not maintained. The nurse must administer the drugs closely to the schedule the client previously established at home. Over time, clients may decreasingly respond to their standard drug therapy and have more frequent off episodes of hypomobility in which they may be unable to rise from a chair, speak, or walk. The drugs apomorphine, known as Apocan and Stelavo, help in relieving this phenomenon. Drugs administered for Parkinsonism can cause a wide variety of adverse effects, such as involuntary movements, which require dose adjustments. The nurse works with physical and occupational therapists to increase the client's level of acti activity, optimize his or her gait, improve balance and coordination, and use adaptive equipment to perform ADLs. On page 639 in your book, you have category and common generic brand names of drugs used for anti-Parkinson agents and um, their intended use, their common side effects, and the safety warning for nurses. You should study that in your book again on page 639. Question, which nursing interventions can help prevent falls in a client with Parkinson's disease? Select all that apply. Keep the client's call light within reach. Apply a soft vest restraint when the client is in bed. Avoid the use of throw rugs. Maintain the client's bed in a low position. Provide a cane or walker for ambulation. The answer is everything except B. Keep the client's collate within reach. Avoid the use of throw rugs. Maintain the client's bed in a low position. 
provide a cane or walker for ambulation. All of these actions are used to prevent falls. Huntington's disease. This is a hereditary disorder of the central nervous system. Huntington's disease is an extra disorder that is transmitted genetic genetically and inherited by people of both genders. The basal ganglia and portions of the cerebral cortex degenerate. In the early stages, clients can participate in most physical activities. However, as the disease progresses, hallucinations, delusions, impaired judgment, and increased intensity of abnormal movements develop. Symptoms develop slowly and include mental apathy and emotional disturbances, choreiform movements, which are uncontrollable writhing and twisting of the body, grimacing, difficulty chewing and swallowing, speech difficulty, intellectual decline, and loss of bowel and bladder control. Severe depression is common and can lead to suicide. Diagnosis is based on symptoms as well as a family history of the disorder Positon emission tomography shows CNS changes, but there is no specific diagnostic test for the disorder. Genetic testing can predict which family members will develop the disease, but not all blood relatives choose to undergo testing. Medical management. Treatment is supportive because there is no specific therapy or cure. Tranquilizers and anti-Parkinson drugs relieve the choreiform movements in some clients. No drugs are available to halt the mental deterioration. Because this disorder is inherited, genetic counseling before a pregnancy is advised. Nursing management. Nursing management aims at meeting client and family needs, such as preventing complications as well as encouraging counseling. The stage of the disease determines the scope of nursing care. The client eventually becomes totally dependent on others. Pneumonia, contractures, infections, aspiration of food or fluids, falls, and pressure ulcers are complications. The nurse prevents them by assessing the client frequently and updating a plan of care. <clears throat> the nurse encourages the client to lead as normal a life as possible, emphasizing the importance of exercise and self-care, and explaining the medical regimen to the client and family. The nurse demonstrates how to facilitate tasks such as using both hands to hold a drinking glass, using a straw to drink, and wearing slip-on shoes. All the disease-modifying drugs can decrease immune cells and infection protection. Therefore, be aware of increased risk for acquired infections, especially if the client is catheterized. In review, diagnostic findings would include the PET scan, genetic testing can predict which family members will develop the disease, medical management, tranquilizers and anti-Parkinson drugs relieve the choreiform movements, genetic counseling before a pregnancy is advised, nursing management, client eventually becomes totally dependent on others, risk for pneumonia, contractures, infections, aspiration of food or fluids, falls, pressure ulcers are complications, as well as depression and suicide. This particular slide is actually generalized seizures is the title. Generalized seizures involve the entire brain. The client loses consciousness and the seizure may last from several seconds to several minutes. Types of generalized seizures include absence seizures, myoclonic seizures, tonic-clonic seizures, and atonic seizures. Absence seizures. Absence seizures, formerly referred to as petite mal seizures, are more common in children. They are characterized by a brief loss of consciousness or cognition during which physical activity ceases. The person stares blankly, the eyelids flutter, the lips move, and slight movement of the head, arm, and legs occur. These seizures typically last for a few seconds, and the person seldom falls to the ground. Because of their brief duration and relative lack of prominent movements, these seizures often go unnoticed. People with absence seizures can have them many times a day. Before diagnosis, many children with absence seizures are misidentified as having a learning disability because during their lapse of attention, they miss instructions or explanations provided by teachers, which compromises their academic success. Myoclonic seizures. 
These seizures are characterized by sudden, excessive jerking of the arms, legs, or entire body. In some instances, the muscle activity is so severe that the client falls to the ground. These seizures are brief. Tonic-clonic seizures, formerly referred to as grand mal seizures, tonic-clonic seizures are characterized by a sequence of events that begins with a pre-ictal or prodromal phase. The pre-ictal phase is the time immediately before a seizure and consists of vague emotional changes such as depression, anxiety, and nervousness. This phase lasts for minutes or hours and is followed by an aura, a sensation that occurs immediately before the seizure. The aura is sensory, i.e. a hallucinatory odor or sound, or a sensation of weakness and numbness. In clients who experience an aura, the aura almost always is the same. The aura is followed by the epileptic cry, which is caused by spasm of the respiratory muscles and muscles of the throat and glottis. This cry immediately precedes loss of consciousness and the ensuing tonic and clonic phases of the seizure. In the tonic phase, the muscles contract rigidly. In the clonic phase, the muscles alternate between contraction and relaxation, resulting in jerking movements and thrashing of the arms and legs. The skin becomes cyanotic and breathing is spasmodic. Saliva mixes with air, resulting in frothing at the mouth. The jaws are tightly clenched and biting of the tongue and inner cheek may occur. Urinary or fecal incontinence is common. The clonic phase lasts for one minute or more, gradually subsides, and is followed by the post-ictal phase, the period following the seizure. The manifestations of this phase include headache, fatigue, deep sleep, confusion, nausea, and muscle soreness. Status epilepticus is marked by a series of tonic-clonic seizures in which the client does not regain consciousness between seizures. If this extremely dangerous condition is not terminated, death can occur. Status epilepticus occurs spontaneously in acute neurologic disorders or for no known reason. It can be precipitated by the abrupt, abrupt discontinuation of an anticonvulsant medication. Because of this, anticonvulsants must be withdrawn gradually. Atonic seizures. Atonic, loss of muscle tone, seizures affect the muscles. The person loses consciousness briefly and falls to the ground. Recovery is rapid. An, a an akinetic loss of movement seizure is similar because muscle tone is lost briefly. The client may or may not fall and recovery is rapid. Assessment findings. The client's motor, sensory, and neurologic functions are normal, except at the time of a seizure. Identification of seizure activity and type of seizure often depends on a witness's description of the client's actions during the seizure. A neurologic examination and EEG are performed. Other laboratory or diagnostic tests, such as a CT scan, MRI, are diagnosis tests used to determine the cause of the seizure disorder. When epilepsy is suspected, a series of EEGs is required if the first results are normal. Medical management. Anticonvulsant drugs such as phenytoin, dilantin, phenobarbital, carbazepine, which is tegretol, IV barbiturates, and diazepam, which is Valium. Nursing management is to position the client on his or her side, loose and restrictive clothing, the airway is kept patent, client is suctioned, and oxygen is administered. Documentation of the situation that preceding the seizure to assist in identifying any precipitating factors or aura, duration of seizure, parts of the body involved should all be documented. Vital signs, oxygen saturation, and capillary blood glucose levels should also be checked. Surgical management of seizures. Seizures that are caused by a brain tumor, brain abscess, or other disorders often require surgical interventions. Surgery for epilepsy is not considered unless the client does not respond to drug therapy and seizures are frequent and severe. The area of the brain in which abnormal electrical discharges are present is identified and mapped. The surgeon must consider whether removal of the involved area would result in permanent neurologic dysfunction such as paralysis or loss of speech. Nursing management. The nurse asks if the client has a history of seizures and the type and pattern of the client's seizure activity. The nurse identifies 
clients who may be seizure prone. For example, a person who has a high fever, has suffered a recent head injury, is withdrawing from alcohol, or is experiencing hypoglycemia or hypoxia, is at risk for having a seizure. The nurse modifies the environment to promote safety if a seizure should occur by placing suction, oral airway, and oxygen equipment at the bedside, patting the side rails and headboard, and maintaining the bed in a low position. Prescribed anticonvulsant therapy is administered and the nurse reinforces <coughs> the importance of drug compliance following discharge. Nutrition Notes 37.4 provides additional information. In the event that a seizure occurs, the nurse positions the client on his or her side and loosens restrictive clothing. The airway is kept patent. <coughs> the client is suctioned and oxygen is given. The mouth is inspected for injuries to the tongue, teeth, and bu buccal cavity, which is the cheek. If the client is incontinent, the nurse cleans the client and changes clothing and bed linen. Documentation includes the situation that preceded the seizure to assist in identifying any precipitating factors or, or the duration of the seizure, parts of the body involved, vital signs, oxygen saturation, and capillary blood glucose level if indicated. Nutrition notes, the clients with a seizure disorder. Anticonvulsants impair vitamin D metabolism leading to calcium imbalance, rickets, rickets or osteomalacia if supplemental vitamin ID Vitamin D is not given. A high fat diet known as ketogenic nutrition therapy is used as part of treatment in children whose seizures are not well controlled on available meds. Fat provides approximately 85 to 90% of the calories in this diet. Protein and carbs are severely limited. The high fat content stimulates, simulates starvation except that the fat burn for energy comes from food, not stored body fat. Mild dehydration helps concentrate blood ketones, it is not known why or how ketosis affects seizure activity. At this time, there is little evidence to support the use of ketogenic nutrition therapy in adults. On page 646 and 647 are the, is the drug therapy table 37.2, agents to control seizures. You need to know these. Brain tumors. Brain tumors are classified according to whether they are benign or malignant, types of cells involved, and the site of the tumor. The causes are viral infection, exposure to radiation, head trauma, and immunosuppression. Assessment findings include headache, most common in the morning, becoming increasingly severe and occurs more frequently as the tumor grows. Vomiting, vomiting occurs without nausea or warning. Papilla edema seizures, speech difficulty, paralysis, and double vision occur. Diagnostic findings are through a CT scan, MRI, a brain scan, or a cerebral angiography.
brain tumors, medical management. Treatment depends on several factors, including the tumor's location and type, primary or metastatic, and the client's age and physical condition. Brain tumors are treated by surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or a combination of these methods. Metastatic tumors and some primary tumors are inoperable, and radiation therapy and chemotherapy are the only treatment choices. Clients who cannot withstand surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy are kept as comfortable and free from pain as possible. Intra arterial or intra fecal administration of anti neoplastic drugs is used to destroy the tumor or slow tumor growth. Symptomatic drug therapy includes corticosteroids and osmotic diuretics to reduce cerebral edema, analgesics, anticonvulsants, and antibiotics. Complications such as increased ICP, paralysis, mental changes, infection, seizures, and prolonged immobility are treated symptomatically. Surgical management. Surgery for an inoperable brain tumor involves a craniotomy, which is an incision through the skull, or craniectomy, excision of part of the skull. A section of bone, bone flap, is removed to reach the brain. After the tumor is removed, the dura is reapproximated, the cut edges are lined up and sewn together. The bone flap is replaced and the skin sutured. The bone flap is not reinserted when increasing ICP or tumor growth is expected. The client's postoperative symptoms are determined by the location and function of any damaged or removed brain tissue. Brain tissue does not regenerate. Another method of removing brain tumors uses a laser beam directed at the tumor site. This surgical technique enables the physician to reach tumors that previously were considered inoperable. Radioisotopes also are surgically inserted into the tumor. However, the cure rate for this procedure is about the same as for external radiation therapy. Gamma knife radiosurgery. Gamma knife radiosurgery is a non-invasive alternative for treating tumors deep within the brain or that conventional surgery can only partially remove. Removing these types of tumors through conventional surgery is difficult or generally impossible and can create the potential for damaging healthy brain tissue. The gamma knife targets the lesion without making an incision, thus eliminating the risk for surgical complications and dangers of prolonged general anesthesia. The gamma knife directs gamma radiation from many computer calculated directions to converge at a precise target area. Radiation is then delivered through holes and a helmet applied to the client's head. A box-shaped head frame attached to the scalp with screws hold the helmet in place and ensures that there is no head movement. Treatment done on an outpatient basis or a 24-hour inpatient stay involves more than one procedure. The duration of each treatment varies from two to four hours depending on the client's pathology. The client remains awake and experiences only a clicking sound as the procedure commences and terminates. Over time, the brain tumor shrinks and disappears. Some clients develop a headache and minor nausea after a treatment. Temporary hair loss may occur if the radiated tumor is close to the surface of the skull. Nursing management. Nursing management depends on the area of the brain affected, tumor type, treatment approach, and the client's signs and symptoms. If the tumor is inoperable or has expanded despite treatment, increased ICP is a major threat. See Nursing Care Plan 37-1. See Chapter 39 for the care of the client undergoing intracranial surgery. Clients who receive chemotherapy and radiation are supported through the adverse effects associated with antineoplastic drug administration and effects of radiation. See, see Chapter 18. The nurse clarifies the client's and family's questions concerning treatment modalities and directs the client to appropriate professionals to discuss treatment alternatives. The nurse explains hospice care and services to clients with brain tumors that no longer are at a stage where they can be cured. Before the client is discharged, the nurse evaluates the client's and family's immediate and long-term needs. The nurse develops an individualized teaching plan that addresses the following components. Medication regimen, appointments for chemotherapy or radiation therapy, adverse effects of chemotherapy or radiation and techniques for managing them, nutritional support, home care considerations, rehabilitation, such as exercises and physical therapy, referrals to support services for physical, emotional, and financial assistance. This is the end of the slideshow.